Shall I start? Yes, you can start. Yes. Good afternoon, all the attendees and dear participants. Myself, Duna Shaha. I welcome you all in our today's program of Webinar Super League WSL on behalf of VXRX India. I would like to thank C. Samraj Physiotherapy Center for arranging this one together with Peak Health Studio Chennai, Sri Sairam Academy Chennai, Physioactive Guru Gram. And I would like to say that we are uh, relaying our today's program in our Fitness and Rehab India YouTube channel. I would like to also welcome our today's volunteer, uh, Prachi Boots. And I would like to welcome our front face and as well the backbone of this program, Dr. Chandra Mohan. And of course, I would like to welcome our today's resource person, Dr. Parth Trivedi. He is MPT Ortho and Sports. He is also a PhD scholar, currently working as a lecturer in CM Patil College of Physiotherapy, Gandhinagar, Gujarat. He is a freelance peer reviewer, Enago Publications academic editor. He is Asian Journal of Orthopedic Research Reviewer and Journal of Harmonized Sciences. He is going to explain to you all on our today's topic, understanding lateral epicondylalgia. Sir, please start the session. Uh, very good evening to all, Dr. Dona. Thanks for a wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Sankar Mohan and team. Uh, as uh, the webinar Super League, uh, this webinar uh, information says that it is all about lateral epicondalgia and so-called it is tennis elbow. Now, just before uh, starting with the, you know, uh, the presentation, which is all about what is lateral epicondalgia, I usually have a tendency to, you know, start my sessions with uh, any interesting motivational videos. Uh, I would like to go with this video, and it has nothing uh, much more relation with the current topic, but uh, I generally have a tendency. I hope you can see my VLC player uh, in this. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, sir, it is visible. Yes. Thank you. 
Uh, yes, uh, so the reason why I had selected this video is this. It is literal apicondalgia or you term it as your tennis elbow or you term it as your uh, literal apicondylitis. Yes, all of them are your sports injuries and majority of them occurs because of repeated overuse or improper biomechanics. Uh, through the video, you know, the role which his father played, that is the role which we as a practitioner play in treating this kind of sports injuries. I don't say that this occurs only in sports people or in athletes. It has a majority of percentage. It occurs into the sports uh, or athletes, but it has a few proportion involved into local population or what we say into general population also. Yes. So what we are going through this is understanding whether we term it as tennis elbow, whether we term it as little apicondylitis or whether it term it as epicondalgia. Yes. So immediately when I had this uh, webinar and the flyers were on, there were few people who had messaged me up that why you have mentioned it little epicondalgia, why you have not mentioned it little epicondylitis. Yes. Or why you have not mentioned a tennis elbow. You can see my uh, slight template, uh, template also, which is predominantly showing that it is a tennis. Uh, but I've mentioned it as a lateral apicondalgia. Yes. So we, in this present or in this session, we are going to discuss about two major things. One is the pathophysiology, why, what happens in this. And second is the treatment approaches and those treatment approaches are strictly based on the evidence yes so moving forward with it uh, i would just like to show that why we have discussing about tennis elbow in its huge yes what is the reason for discussing tennis elbow in such a se serious manner or probably in a concerned manner yes so you can see we have our own Sachin Tendulkar, where he has mentioned that he, he thought at a point of time that, you know, his career was over because of tennis elbow. Yes. So at a point of time, I think if I'm not wrong, it was in 2001 and 2002 during his series. Uh, during these two years, he was in such a tremendous pain that he was not able to lift his own bat. Yes. And then after uh, through uh, surgery and through tremendous rehab and uh, technique modifications, he was back into the field. So this is what happens to an athlete when you know uh, an injury struck suddenly. We have one of our uh, so-called uh, Bollywood actress, Urvashi Dolakya. She was recently diagnosed with tennis elbow because of extreme use of mobile phone. Yes, so this is what we see generally. Uh, when, he, when it comes to tennis elbow, we always think that it is the backhand stroke or probably it is because of your repeated wrenching movements of the wrist. Even the cell phones are now, you know, repeated use in our day-to-day uh, -day life 
are causing this tennis elbow. And this one is the baseball player, Tom Brady. And he was also uh, being affected with tennis elbow. So globally, so this is, if you can see, this is 2019 December. So it is just recently uh, he was diagnosed with tennis elbow. So concern over here is what is the optimum treatment, first thing. And second thing, how are we going to term it? Whether we are going to term it as tennis elbow, whether we are going to term it as epicondylitis, or whether we are going to term it as epicondalgia. So I would like uh, to get the first poll done. Uh, Dr. Duna, I, if you can help me out with the first poll question. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Sir, uh, with the polls, all the questions will be available at once. Uh, okay, then we can have it as of right now only? Yeah, yeah, we can have it. Yes, yes. So Should I launch it? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm launching the polls. So to all the participants, we are launching with the polls. Uh, the first is question the poll is, available? Yes, yes, yes. The first question is, is it apicondylitis or apicondalgia? So please select whatever you want. Please don't select based on the topic title. Yes, please select what you are aware about it. Second question is, only wrist extension causes LE, uh, lateral apicondylitis, apicondalgia, and is therapeutic ultrasound effective in LE? So whatever you want, you can select it. I am not going to opt it for this poll. You can opt it out. You can opt in for this poll. I am opting out from this poll. Please, I hope the polling is done. The polling is going on, sir. Okay. Please let 49, me know. 49 attendants already answered. We have 92 now. Yes. Who are attending? 68% already voted. Seventy percent voted already. Still a few left. I request all the participants to please take part. Yes, please take part and answer whatever you are aware about it. Please forget about. Uh, we are not going to score you on this basis. Seventy-four people completed answering. We'll just wait somewhere around two more minutes for this, and then we'll move ahead. Okay, Participants who are joining now, even they can take part in this voting. Yes. We have ninety-seven participants here in poll. Ninety-nine. 97, sir, in poll. I can see 99. Okay. Yeah. Nine, 97 is done? No, sir. 77 has completed. We have here in poll 97 participants. Uh, okay. Uh, so we'll move, we'll move ahead with this. I think majority of them have... Uh, sir, if you wish, we can continue for um, 30 or 40 seconds. Okay. More. Okay. okay. Fine, sir. 80 of 90, 100 uh, participants have pulled it. Great. So we'll move ahead with that. Then. Yes, sir. I think somebody is scribbling the. Yes. Please help me out with the uh, annotation uh, because while the presentation, I think there are unintentionally the annotation has been used by somebody. Anyways, uh, we'll move ahead with this. So uh, the reason why we are much more focusing with the uh, this kinds of uh, orthopedic or sports related condition is because majority of these conditions occurs in two athletes. Oh, great. Oh, great, great, great. So we have uh, the sharing results. So majority of them, 73% have told me that it is epicondylitis. Uh, 
second question only wrist extension causes any 23 percentage have said yes and 78 have no and is therapeutic ultrasound effective in any 91 percentage and 9 percentage have said no great so uh yes with this we would be uh considering the polls and we would discuss all these three major questions in the our presentation so yes so whenever this kinds of injury occurs to an athlete the concern is the athlete is out of the game and the athlete in today's world is under so much tremendous pressure to come back on field and prove that nobody can take his place so once the athlete is out of the field yes that person is in that tremendous pressure that if is prolonged period of time he is out of the field somebody else will take that place and the career is over and injuries don't come and knock your door that may i come in injuries come suddenly yes so our role as therapist is to focus on best available evidence based treatment rather than what we know or rather than what the world is doing yes currently we have a globalized scenario of uh, covid 19 yes some one odd day i would not like to name out the uh, company's name we had a uh, somewhere again uh, two days or three days back uh, a company had a huge press conference and had claimed the efficacy of you know uh, its medicine in uh, treating corona virus and immediately after 2 3 hours our government reacted it and we the company was been told that you know you prove that whether it is effective or not so this is what we are currently focusing on that how are we going to treat this condition and what is the pathophysiology what is the pathophysiology of this so moving ahead with this uh yes what are we going to see we are just going to concern about definition and characteristics of uh, the Uh, lateral epicondylitis epicondalgia tennis elbow yes any tell me uh, pathophysiology signs and symptoms diagnosis and management so this will be our presentation flow and gradually we will move on uh, with this so general term definition as i said we had seen in our previous uh, newspaper cutouts also yes majority of them majority of them term it out as tennis elbow yes and why because it was the term which was been first used by runge in 1873 so it is not a new phenomena since 1873 we are into this term known as tennis elbow yes i have used the heading general term yes so definition this is in general terms and this is in majority of terms okay now generally what we say that tennis elbow is a condition which affects the lateral epicondyle or the common extensor group of muscles and the extensor group of muscles what they do is they extend the wrist so when you are repeatedly using this wrist extension movement you have a tendency of injuring these common extensor group of muscles and basically it is extensor carpi radialis brevis the most commonest muscle is extensor carpi radialis brevis okay so here what we have two basic uh one is lateral epicondyle of the humerus definitely we are considering humerus here and another is medial epicondyle yes this lateral epicondyle we have common extensors of wrist origin yes and over the medial epicondyle 
we have common flexor group of muscle of this bridge so these two are basically the origin point of two different group of muscles one is common extensors another is common flexors this common extensors an injury to this is known as lateral epicondyl i will term it as epicondalgia currently because i have my own title over this and this is known as medial epicondylitis okay so you would one currently who are actively participating in this presentation should have a question why i have mentioned it as epicondalgia over here and why i have mentioned here as epicondylitis okay so you have all the rights to question me and prove me wrong okay so let us go to my slide again so briefly coming out that the term was first described in 1873 by runch it is tennis elbow yes there is no doubt about it why it was tennis elbow because during that period of time it was more seen in tennis players okay and to your surprise you would if you see the uh, athletic injuries now you would see very less people affecting by this condition in tennis now because of advanced biomechanical analysis and advanced rehab yes so this is the reason why now this injury is now gradually decreasing into the athletic population and it is now much more into our general population and the general definition is an injury occurring to the lateral epicondyle region lateral epicondyle region okay lateral epicondyle region of the humerus and pain over that region is known as lateral epicondylitis okay so basically the definition can be divided into three major parts one is structurally affected which kind of structures are affected second is which kind of activity restriction is there and third is what kind of participation restriction is there now why i have mentioned it about structures and uh participation and activity the reason is because of icf international classification of disease yes so when you term this or in in previous version it was known as icidh okay so when you are talking about anything or when you are presenting about anything you just cannot say that this is a or this is b we need to have a international classification code and that is why i have currently divided the definition into three basic parts international on the basis of international classification of disease in this particularly three major things are being concerned one is structure which is affected another the activity which is restricted and another is participation which is restricted so based on these three phenomena we have this international classification yes so what kind of structures are being affected in this the structure which are affected in this is basically extensor tendon as i said common extensor tendons are affected of the forearm and you have seen a gradually decrease in degeneration of collagen and additionally it might be affected by composition of neural drive and stiffness of muscle tendon complex so when you have an injury progressing gradually progressing into a chronic stage from acute you see that muscle fiber compositions like collagen fibers decreases and it has been uh, increased by fibroblast so this muscle fiber composition gets involved you have nociceptors coming into picture and then you have restricted range of motions in elbow also and in wrist also causing it this kind of definition 
based on structure which is affected. Now, based on activity which is affected. So basically, as I said, it is your wrist extension movement which gets affected. Additionally, you have inabilities in gripping, inabilities in holding things. Yes, if, we, if I want to hold my cell phone also, this causes pain. This causes pain in chronic cases and in severe cases. So this basically is the activity which gets affected. It is performing excessive, quick, repetitive activities like gripping or manipulating objects, manipulating like you are using it. Yeah, you are, you know, you are wrenching your cloths. Yes, that kind of activity causes pain over lateral epicondyle region, which can be radiated over the forearm aspect. So that is the major activity which gets involved. And what are the participation restrictions? Once this happens, what happens to the individual? What kind of restrictions are there? It is functional impairments like causing difficulty to work, like some if, if a person is a laborer and he is involved in nailing things that gets affected a mechanic a screwdriver yes if that uh, participation is restricted sometimes holding a grocery bag is also getting affected so this ultimately what it causes it reduces the productivity of an individual so basically revising it very quickly we have based on the structure Yes, I will say common extensors are involved. Activity, wrist, extension, and gripping activities are involved. And participation restriction. We have in numbers of participation and reducing the productivity. OK. So these are the basic takeaway points from our definition section that once a patient or once an individual gets affected with later apicondylitis, you know, uh, I have seen individuals taking it very lightly and I have seen, uh, you know, individuals getting treatment. Uh, one of the most commonest treatment is our steroid injections immediately. And then they later come up with uh, severe pain. So uh, I'll discuss the management part gradually once we move on uh, with this. So briefly discussing about the anatomy of the elbow joint. Uh, we are not much discussing about the anatomy of wrist joint. Why? Because the insertion part is there into the uh, wrist joint. Uh, we are much more concerned over the origin of pain. Yes, so that is the reason we are uh, discussing about anatomy of elbow joint. So type of joint, it is a hinge type of joint. So hinge type of joint means you just have uh, one degree of freedom, that is your flexion and extension. So these two basic uh, types of movements are available. Uh, bones, you have humerus, radius, and ulna. Uh, get joining together and getting your elbow joint. Yes. Which kinds of ligaments do we have? We have ulnar collateral ligaments, radial collateral ligaments, annular ligaments, and quadrate ligaments. So basically, uh, when an elbow strain is considered, a very less kind of uh, a percentage of uh, people suffer from the elbow strain injuries, you have ulnar ligaments and radial ligaments getting into picture. Rather, these annual ligaments and quadrate ligaments are very small. Uh, Common muscles, what kind of muscles do we have which either originate or either insert at your uh, elbow joint? We have biceps muscle, which is inserting, triceps muscles, which is inserting, common extensors of wrist origin, common flexors of wrist origin, pronate arteries origin, brachioradialis, uh, again insertion, brachialis insertions, and anconis insertion. So basically, these three group of muscles are supinator. I have not mentioned it uh, because of the concern uh, of the topic. So these three kind group of muscles are basically 
the origin muscles yes and uh, rest of them are insertion muscles blood supply uh, if we talk about the blood supply yes uh, to the elbow joint we have proximal to the elbow and distal to the elbow so the proximal to the elbow is ulnar collateral artery uh, middle collateral artery radial recurrent artery and ulnar recurrent artery okay i can see somebody who is you know uh, using the annotation apart from me uh, the above annotations are not from me uh, so just to avoid what can i do is i will use the spotlight okay so the blood supply is basically divided into two major sections proximal to the elbow and distal to the elbow uh, it is mainly through your ulnar collateral artery radial collateral artery and middle collateral artery and radial recurrent and ulnar recurrent arteries so as i said it is a hinge type of joint uh, we have flexions and extensions and clinically uh, we majorityly see fracture and which fracture is common uh, supracondylar fracture of humerus is much more common uh, when we term it about uh, clinical into the elbow joint epicondylitis you have lateral epicondylitis or lateral epicondalgia and uh, medial epicondylitis and epicondalgia and arthritis so we have very less population coming because of elbow arthritis i elbow arthritis is not only osteoarthritis uh, we have uh, rheumatoid arthritis we can term it out as gout also coming into picture because of this okay so this is what we are what is our anatomy of elbow joint is considered so now what is the role of ecrb and ecrl when i term it out as ecrb it is extensor carpi radialis brevis and ecrl it is extensor carpi radialis longus brevis a small muscle longus larger muscle so basically these two muscles are much more into brisk extensor yes and on to the these two muscles you have brachioradialis muscle coming into the picture throughout the forearm and what these two muscles do these two muscles basically do pure wrist extensions and radial deviations sometimes radial deviation occurs okay so because of this you have pure wrist extension of ecrb and ecrl and a radial deviation is the major role of ecrb and ecrl so why these two muscles work and why these two are the only muscles which are getting affected okay so we will see yes you can see these two figure the above one i have mentioned it with good and the second one ah uh, sorry yes 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 this is good and this is poor now why i have mentioned it okay so if you see the movement of force is going on from the shoulder to the elbow and then to the wrist so here you have minimal extension of wrist minimal extension of wrist and the major amount of force yes is generated through your larger group of muscles that is your back muscles and your shoulder girdle muscles and it has been transferred to your elbow group of muscles and then you have a wrist extension so whenever the ball strikes yes so there is less counter effect of the ball yes causing it to sudden wrist flexion and you don't have to force fully you don't have to force the wrist extension much more so that the ball reaches to the opposite pole whereas if you see this poor why i have mentioned it poor the force which has been generated by your large group of shoulder girdle muscles or big muscles it has transferred to the elbow and then it has to travel to the wrist much more larger distance much more longer distance and then you see the wrist 
has to extend fully wrist has to extend fully so you have a huge amount of concentric muscle force huge amount of concentric muscle force coming into the picture so for example this is my uh, racket tennis racket yes i'm just specifically talking about my backhand stroke this is your backhand stroke so if this i have holded this and if i have the group of muscle uh, force which is traveling from shoulder group and it is traveling to the elbow so what i am supposed to do i am just supposed to do flicker of contraction yes so the force will be automatically transferred from my shoulder group of muscles to the tennis ball and the ball will move so i have to put much more lesser lesser amount of energy for that stroke whereas if i am having an extended elbow and then i am supposed to uh, uh, give a backhand stroke more force will be generated from the lateral epicondyle which is your wrist extensors and then what will happen if the ball will always give a counter reaction force and you have an eccentric contraction following so immediately after your concentric contraction you have an eccentric contraction and much more compared to your concentric contraction your eccentric contraction yes eccentric contraction of ecrb is responsible for this yes so you have two types of con uh, muscle contractions when we term it about your isotonic contractions uh, you have a uh, concentric contractions and eccentric contraction in concentric contraction what happens you have the insertion group of muscle insertion of the muscle moving towards the origin of the muscle and in eccentric contraction you have uh, the insertion of the muscle moving towards uh, or moving away from the origin so in this you can see the much more wrist extension forces needed or that has been given by your wrist group of muscle here the transformation of the force will occur and here more force will be required by wrist okay to get the work done so this is what i hope uh, the things are clear we can discuss it later on in the question answer sections so yes moving on towards the pathophysiology yes so i have mentioned clearly traditional view yes so in 1936 as we all know in 1873 tennis elbow was the term which was uh, been uh, coined by runge okay so in 1973 dr j seriax yes so you would have heard about seriax manipulation or seriax deep friction massage the same person had termed that repeated contractions sorry repeated contractions of wrist extensor group of muscles basically your ecrb and ecrl that leads to your macroscopic and microscopic tear okay and this is because of your chronic overuse chronic overuse means repeated repeated wrist extension causes macroscopic and microscopic tears okay as these tears attempt to unite what happens it leads to inflammation so once there is a tear yes once there is a tear these uh, definitely body will try to heal itself and this healing procedure will cause inflammation and that is the reason where we as a, a therapist or probably the treatment uh, managers okay we consider over anti inflammatory anti inflammation properties so that is the reason anti inflammatory model of rehabilitation is used when we term it about especially about nsets or our therapeutic modalities like ultrasound yes okay so these two basic things work upon our 
own anti-inflammatory models. Yes. So that is the reason we are using anti-inflammatory. So now to how extent it is right. Okay. So let us discuss about why it is tendinosis. So before uh, I request the participants, please don't use this annotations. You know, uh, before we move on towards the uh, tendinosis cycle, I would like to show you one more video so that you know you are definitely not getting bored with my presentation. So this is what yes, we were discussing. So this is what we were discussing. Yes, uh, the backhand stroke. Can you stroke. find the stop annotation option? Okay. Excuse me, sir. Yeah, just wait a minute, Dr. Dona. Yes. Can you see the stop uh, annotation option? Uh, actually, it is there into our, uh, uh, if you go www.zoom.us, uh, you need to sign it, sign in. No, and then you stop need to annotation start. option is available with you, sir, because you are sharing your screen. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll check it out later on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So uh, this is what we have discussed in our previous uh, pictorial uh, presentation also. So basically what happens, you are continuously using your wrist extensor group of muscles and this wrist extensor group of muscles gets into macro and microscopic tears and then it leads to inflammation. And because of inflammation, we have termed it out as lateral apicondylitis. Now, Till this period, we were just thinking that, you know, we are just, if you just imagine this is a movie which is going on and we were, there was one hero, which is lateral apicondylitis. Yes. So we are just thinking that lateral apicondylitis is our hero till this moment. And we have done uh, the polling also. Yes. So majority of us, we think that lateral apicondylitis is our hero, but uh, my dear uh, participants, sequential studies, sequential studies, which are later performed from 1970s, they have termed it out that the failed reparative process of main extensor carpi radialis brevis tendon is the main reason for pain and disability. Yes. So there were studies based on the cadavers and even uh, the patients who had undergone with lateral uh, tennis elbow, they found that there are no inflammatory markers into the study, uh, into the patients or into ECRB muscles. So there is actually, there are no more inflammatory markers are not available, but the repetitive injury is causing trouble to ECRB muscle. And that ECRB muscle, because of repetitive use, is failing to regenerate. And once it is failing to regenerate because of normal collagen synthesis, the fibroblast come into picture. Now these collagen and fibroblast are like identical brothers. The collagen has much more elasticity and much more uh, tensile stress compared to your fibroblast. These tensile, this collagen, because of repetitive injury, these collagen are replaced by fibroblast. And 
fibroblasts are lesser elastic components and having lesser tensile stress so uh, if you are aware about a stress strain curve the stress strain curve goes like this okay where it is the uh, uh, optimum stress period and this is your healing period yes so this stress strain based on the stress strain curves your collagen are much more having much more elastic property and having much more tensile stress compared to your fibroblast and this is proved by dr r nishal in 1970 that there is a dense population of fibroblast and immature collagen and immature collagen and he termed this as angiofibroblastic hyperplasia hyperplasia means the count of fibroblast has increased in ecrv muscles so it is not the inflammation it is not the inflammation it is angiofibroblastic hyperplasia which is the main culprit of this injury so it would not be right to term apicondylitis it would be the right to term apicondalgia okay you will get clear picture with this then the question comes yes majority of you would ask me sir then why it is epicondylitis everywhere epicondylitis even the orthopedic practitioners write even you have seen many textbooks even the uh, the older version of uh, clinical orthopedic rehabilitation by s brodsman termed it out as uh, epicondylitis it is just because of popularity and inherent simplicity we are terming it out as epicondylitis okay because of its inherent simplicity and remain entrenched we are terming it out about it epicondylitis i think majority of you would question me later on that you know i am contradicting but this is what numerous studies have focused on and a good number of meta analysis have said that epicondylitis needs to be replaced by epicondalgia the question was goes to first uh, then why we are terming it out as medial epicondylitis yes till this point till this presentation there are no studies or less number of studies supporting the medial epicondalgia okay specific studies are done on lateral epicondylitis and lateral epicondalgia there is no much more strong proof evidence saying it it is apic medial apicondalgia so that is the reason i had mentioned medial apicondylitis there and i am continuously repeatedly saying it is apicondalgia why it is apicondalgia because inflammatory markers are not there and you have a angiofibroblastic hyperplasia being replaced okay so that is the reason it is epicondalgia so then what is the cause of pain okay so if it is not inflammation what is the cause of pain the cause of pain is your irritants biochemical irritants your lactic acid and chondroitin sulfate these two basic things act as your pain uh, causing substances so that is the reason we are getting pain okay ah uh, so basically if you talk about the pain component and the disability component you have three main components coming into picture one is your tendon pathology which we have discussed angiofibroblastic hyperplasia that is the reason which is causing pain second comes your neurogenic composition yes so mechanical stimulations of the nociceptors so continuous using of wrist extensors your nociceptors nociceptors are first uh, order of pain yes uh, sensitors so these pain sensitors get actually activated because of repetitive uh, movements and those nociceptors of ecrb tendon release your precipitates and causes vasodilation and plasma extravasion causing it as neurogenic inflammation okay so this is the reason where you have neurogenic component coming into picture 
So we have discussed for what reasons pain is there. First reason is your uh, tendon pathology. Tendon pathology, angiofibroblastic hyperplasia. Second reason is your nociceptors. Why? Because of neurogenic inflammation. And third one is your decrease in muscle strength. Decrease in muscle strength because of mucopolysaccharide infiltration. Muco polysaccharide infiltration. So actually as it term it out as saccharides, saccharides are nothing but a glucose chain. So muco means mucus and polysaccharide. So mucus and polysaccharide, n numbers of polysaccharide glucose chain are being found into ECRB muscles. Very miniature bone formation occurs. Yes, vascular proliferation is there and immature fibroblasts are there. So because of all these reasons, the muscle strength decreases. So this is known as three model uh, pain component stimulus. So this is, I would like to show you in an article. Yes. So this is what it is known as pathophysiology. So it is an interactive component. Yes, into pathophysiology local tendon pathophysiology, pain system, and motor system impairment. So these three components, these three components are there into the reason it is known as tendinosis. So one may ask why it is only ECRP, why it is not ECRL, or why it is not any other extensor, extensor RP. Ulnar is coming into picture. First thing, it has compromised blood supply. Yes. So because of vas neovascularization, yes, you have lesser blood supply. So that is why inconsistent vascular pattern and compromised blood supply, ECRB is much more involved. Whenever you have an eccentric activity, this flexion, your ECRB will get strained much more. And in the limited internal rotation, so if my extra uh, uh, the shoulder is much more internal rotated if you can see me in my video the force can be transformed easily to my elbows and to the wrist so if i have much more external rotation it becomes difficult to transfer my force to the wrist so that is the reason so if much more in external rotation is there you know we have much more stress tensile stress over ecrb group of muscle Yes, so that is the reason uh, the ECRB is much more involved into this. Few people have complaints of pain while pronation. While pronation. So why pronation? Because radial head, ECRB, is functioning over the radial head also. Yes. And it causes extension of wrist based on radial head rotation. Yes. So that is the reason ECRB muscle, when it is being stressed out, it causes pain over pronating activity also. So basically, wrist extension and pronation, these two things cause pain over the regions. And what are the other structures? Uh, without much wasting time, we have local articular ligaments, nerve lesions and cervical fine structures getting into picture. Uh, so you have differential diagnosis, I'll see it. So yes, this is the tendinosis cycle. Okay, so tendinosis cycle, you have increased demand of a tendon. So once this increased demand of tendon, it is your repeated wrist extension and flexion movements. Okay, so if you give adequate repair, it will adapt. If there is no repair, what will happen? Premature collagen will come. So premature collagen tenocytes will form abnormal bones and uh, the muscle will be uh, reducing into the strength. Further re uh, reduction in the collagen, predeposition of further injury and this cycle goes on. So ultimately we need to break this cycle to get into adequate repair. So that is why we term it out this as a tendinosis cycle and lateral apicondalgia not epicondylitis. So what I have discussed in detail is pathophysiology. The pathophysiology is of 
three major parts lack of inflammatory responses substances into these studies you have local tendon pathology angiofibroblastic pain systems yes uh, your nociceptors yes lactic acid components and motor system impairments reduce collagen stress, uh, fibers or reduce stress of the muscles so these three are basically responsible for getting your lateral epicondylia what are the classical signs and symptoms pain over lateral epicondyle of the humerus tenderness decrease grip strength and localized swelling so these are the three basic uh, signs and symptoms of this uh, injury diagnosis uh, i much i'm not going at in detail depth of diagnosis what does mri says or what does ultrasonography says because if i continue with this it would take somewhere around 2 3 hours to complete this presentation so just briefing it out we have three major tests if you see this one uh, this is your cousin's test the second one is mills test and the third one is your motley's test so in mills a cousin's test what you are doing elbow is slide uh, slightly flexed okay and it is a pronated and you ask the patient or the ask the athlete to extend the wrist over your resisted movement so if it is he is extending the wrist and uh, you are resisting the movement and if there is pain over lateral epicondyle region over this specific region it called it is the positive cousin's test whereas in mills test it is extended elbow and you are flexing it you are flexing it your uh, uh, wrist so if pain is there in this lateral epicondyle region it is a uh, positive mills test and modly stays extending the middle finger and asking the patient whether the pain is there or not this is modly stays so what is the difference between cousin stays and mill stays here you are seeing the concentric activity and here you are seeing the eccentric activity of the muscle okay so sometimes it is possible your cousin is negative and your mill is positive because of the eccentric group of muscle uh, component involved so it is always better to uh, test at least two test uh, rather than relying on only one test then we have ultrasonography uh, and mri to confirm uh, i would just uh, name it out i will not go in depth analysis of this okay yes what are the treatment outcome measures okay so the treatment outcome measures are basically pain yes pain how are we going to check it out whether the pain unlike uh, the temperature we don't have uh, any equipment which measures pain yes so pain is always subjective and it is a multifactorial uh, component so you have visual analog scan you have nprs and various macgill pain questionnaire is there i will just uh, explain the difference between the visual analog scale and nprs the difference between visual analog scale is uh, if you can see my uh, scale this is horizontal visual analog scale on to the left it is 0 on to the right it is 10 so if i term it 0 means minimum pain and 10 means maximum pain the subject or the patient is supposed to put a line over this so for example i put a line over this there is no number so it is assumed that pain is somewhere between 3 and 4 okay so there are no numbers uh, so sometimes uh, you can write no pain and or minimal pain and on to right you can write maximum pain yes so there are no numbers so that is why it is visual analog scale and in nprs scale yes uh, this is again a horizontal scale you have uh, yes 0 1 2 3 and so on till 10 so you have numbers in this and if once you are asking it what kind of pain is there if the patient says this it is obviously 3 so this is the basic difference between visual analog scale and numerical pain rating scale i always prefer that uh, we should move on to nprs because of its reliability and validity compared to vas but still majority of people are using visual analog scale 
then hand grip strength it is your hand dynamometer we are seeing it in uh, later as an image functional performance uh, patient rated tennis elbow evaluation prt again i will be showing it how we are uh, scoring it uh, dash dynamic arm shoulder scale shoulder and hand scale this is again a scale and muscle activity is through uh, surface emg i will show you one of the video also later on how we can uh, see the surface emg and how we can use it in virtual we have so uh, yes this is your hand dynamometer so if you if you can see over here uh, first line second line third line fourth line and fifth line uh, sorry this is your first second third fourth and fifth grip so currently the hand dynamometer is on to the third uh, level so as far as studies are considered an american society of hand therapists asht they recommend that the hand dynamometer should be used in the third position third position yes and three trials should be given three trials should be given so here you can see uh, the numbers onto the outer ring and numbers onto the inner ring see outer ring numbers are usually in pounds and inner ring numbers are usually in kgs so uh, in india we generally prefer kgs and in uh, western countries uh, the readings are generally preferred in pounds uh, but when you term it about international standards pound is much more preferred value and uh, for uh, getting the ratings done so what are we supposed to do it while taking the ratings first thing you are supposed to ask the patient to sit erect in an unsupported arm chair there should not be arm rest and ask the patient to do 90 degrees of elbow flexion you are asking the patient and giving the hand dynamometer in the hand and then asking the patient to squeeze as much as possible so once the squeezing is done this reading will go up okay so like this you are supposed to take three readings and average of that three readings is considered as your grip strength okay uh, moving on with the patient rated uh, tennis elbow evaluation this tennis elbow evaluation has two major components uh, first it was known as prfetq and now it is known as prtee -E. uh, it is pain score is there yes pain score is there and function score is there in pain you have five pain items and in function you have 10 pain items so best score is again zero and worst score is again 50 uh, we are not moving on how to read this scale but i'm just giving you a brief idea about this so so what are the pain questions when you are rest are you having pain so if yes rated two when you are doing a task eight when you are carrying plastic bag seven when you are at your palm is at least what is the pain and when you are at worst nine pain so you can here you can see that you know various components of pain how the pain is there at what time the pain is there and when is the maximum pain is there so this is what it has been uh, this domain concerns so what you are supposed to do is you are supposed to do the totaling and divide it by 50 so here uh, you'll get a total and specific activities they are again divided into two one is uh, the activities are again divided into two specific activities and usual activities so like if you are turning the door knob if you are carrying the grocery bags if you are opening the jar pulling up the pants you are washing it out uh, wash towels or wet so what kind of in difficulties you are facing it out please see this is not pain this is difficult okay and usual activities like dressing washing household activities uh, work activities so you are supposed to rate it out about 10 so please make sure that all these readings are rated by patient himself and not by the therapist okay so ultimately what you are getting it done you are uh, getting the scores done so 31 was your pain score and 14 was your functional score so what is your score 45 out of 100 more the score more the disability and lesser the score lesser the disability and pain so this is what uh, your hand uh, evaluation matters so nowadays uh, to all the uh, listeners whenever you are taking an assessment please make sure 
that you are following SOAP format, subjective, objective, assessment, and planning format. And in assessment, you are not only measuring pain, you are measuring the uh, functional capacities also. Okay, through various questionnaires. So this basically proves that you are putting an evidence for treating a patient. Okay, and you would definitely you would require to you know review it later on. So this is the differential diagnosis. Okay, lateral epicondylitis, uh, intraarticular pathology, cervical radiculopathy. Lateral. This is again from your S. Crotsman. Okay. Um, so well localized pain, tender, generalized elbow pain, diffuse lateral arm, vague. So these are what your differential diagnosis is. So generally, uh, lateral epicondylgia, uh, if you rule it out from cervical spine pathology, I generally, what I do is to just to rule out if the patient says, you know, he is having a bit radiating pain over the forearm component only, I generally do uh, cerv uh, cervical pain test like uh, spalling test or the compression test to just to rule out whether the cervical spine is uh, involved or not. Okay. So this is what you I generally do. Yes. So now we are talking it about management. Okay, I think we have crossed one hour ten minutes. Uh, so quickly revising. I hope uh, Dr. Dona and Dr. Chandra Mohan. Uh, uh, there is no issues with the time limits. No, no sir, you can continue, no, sir. Um, okay. 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 So uh, the I am not going to talk what is there into the books. Or what people say. I personally believe I need evidence and I need systematic evidence. I just don't need uh, a case report uh, to prove that this uh, treatment is effective. Yes. So, why I have stated non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs? Because all the evidences currently say this that you know you are supposed to use NSAIDs and majority of the prescriptions uh, they have NSAIDs. So that is why I have mentioned about NSAIDs, corticosteroid injections. I think this would be new to all of you. Topical glycerol trinitrate uh, patches are used. Uh, then we are thinking it about exercise therapy, manual therapy, taping, ultrasound, and extracorporeal shockwave therapy, laser, orthotics, acupuncture, PRP injections. These are coming into Nowadays, uh, I have seen many uh, orthopedic practitioners and even uh, the patients taking these platelet rich plasma injections. Again, hyaluron gel injections and botulinum toxin injections are also available and surgery. So, each and every will be uh, treatment. I am not going to uh, discuss how it is given. I am going to discuss what is the evidence and how we are going to put into our management. Okay. Uh, yes, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Definitely, it uh, reduces the inflammation. It causes reduction in the pain. But studies say that there is no long-term efficacy. So once you are being treated with NSAIDs, there are chances of recurrence. And always, you have a side effects of gastrointestinal ble uh, bleedings, GI complications, and renal impairments. And at a point, tendon healing is risked because of inflammation. Because of inflammation, there is no granulation tissue formation. Collagen fibers are restricted and tendon repair is restricted. So again, that tendinosis cycle, which we have discussed, we cannot break that type. So NSAIDs, not more uh, long-term efficacy is not seen. Yes. Definitely, it is effective in acute cases and subacute cases, and immediate effect has been given through NSAIDs. Okay, but topical NSAIDs, yes, if you talk about topical NSAIDs like pain relief sprays, uh, diclofenac sprays, or acyclofenac sprays, which are available into the markets, uh, small studies say that it gives effects up to four weeks. Okay, so again, uh, if you want, we can use topical inserts rather than your uh, tablet forms okay uh, for pain reliefs 
corticosteroid injections one of the most commonest practice in uh, treating this condition is corticosteroid injections i have personally seen uh, the reason why i am discussing this topic in much depth is because in my masters i had this topic as my research my phd is on this topic and i have somewhere around 8 to 9 publications international publications in this uh, topic so this is my area of interest and i have seen somewhere around no, not less than 200 patients not less than 200 patients for tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis during this tenure of somewhere around 7 to 8 years these patients yes immediate result is corticosteroid injections okay so very in short term yes corticosteroid injections give short term pain relief but the patients who have undergone corticosteroid injections in somewhere between 6 to 8 weeks come back with the same pain and the pain intensity has increased in this patient group of patients so this is clearly seen in two large group of trials and they say that 72% of patients treated with steroid injection experience recurrence within 12 months that is just in a year yes this is what study says but i have seen somewhere around 12 weeks or some 12 to 16 weeks duration of time so that is somewhere around 3 months or 2 to 3 months these patients come back with us and say that the pain has increased okay so this is what it is highly discouraged and i i don't recommend my patients or my uh, uh, even to you that you we should not recommend corticosteroid injections to some people it would hurt yes but this is not recommended or based on evidence tgn topical glycerol trinitrate patches okay it has shown effect on tendon healing but one of the most commonest uh, side effect is headache dizziness and irritation okay uh, very less population people and very less practitioners use this kind of patches for pain relief uh, so that is why i have mentioned that in 2011 uh, mccallum did a study with uh, somewhere around 58 patients very less group of people uh, 58 is nothing yes six patients uh, six months of topical gtn and placebo effect and rehabilitation uh, but five years after discontinuation of therapy uh, there was no difference in pain and hand grip strength so there is actually there is no much more significant evidence for tgn okay and it has no additional long term benefits so you may see that you know nsaids are not working corticosteroids are not working tgn is not working yes uh, till this date you know uh, treating this condition i would give you an example uh, somewhere around uh, 20 days back uh, just before starting of this month i had received a call from one of the leading orthopedic practitioner uh, from uh, amdavad uh, the patient was of somewhere around 35 years old male patient uh, two years back long standing history of chronic uh, tennis elbow uh, patient first time when he had uh, tennis elbow he had uh, underwent corticosteroid injections and after uh, four months the pain increased and what was his injury uh, why the injury uh, was causing pain it was because he had one dog and the dog had a hip hyperplasia so the dog was not able to move so while taking care of dog he used to this kind of movements so that was causing pain so later on uh, he met with uh, another orthopedic surgeon in amdavad uh, he gave again corticosteroid injections but there was no effect in that uh, patient so he changed the third orthopedic surgeon uh, that third orthopedic surgeon again uh, prescribed nsaid there was no much difference uh, then the patient was given prp and dextrose injections the pain reduced by somewhere around uh, 30 to 40 percent and the patient was then referred to me by the that practitioner stating it out that i should look after that patient and uh, the treatment should be given so till one and a half years or probably uh, quarter to two years the patient had not underwent physiotherapy treatment okay so i'll 
I later on say what I had given. Okay, I'll, I'll keep a suspense over this. Exercise therapy, yes, good evidence says that uh, your exercise therapy, like strengthening exercises and stretching exercises, are helpful. Uh, why? Because it, the tendon remodeling occurs, and your muscles has an adaptive responses. So isokinetic, isometric, isotonic, and plyometric exercises are helpful. So uh, generally, what I do is, and based on the analysis, uh, meta analysis, and evidence base, we generally start with isometric. contractions first yes then we move to isotonic contractions and then isokinetic if available yes if not available we jump to plyometric exercises why plyometric exercise this plyometric exercises are used to train the athlete yes because plyometric exercises has stress strain okay and in short duration of time so we are basically focusing on stress and strain uh, cycle of a muscle and we are putting uh, elongating the muscle and shortening the muscle in very short duration of time this helps us out in uh, recurrence of the uh, injury so majority of the cases uh, if you see evidence uh, chronic cases come back again and again again and again so in one of my uh, study maybe i have done one of my study uh it is under publication so i would not uh, disclose the data about it but we have found that somewhere around 70 percentage of people who uh, who are been administered with plyometric exercises have a positive outcome and that group is like uh 150 patients we have taken 150 samples we have taken so uh, let's hope that it gets published and i can share with you all uh So recent meta analysis have shown that stretching plus strengthening exercises gives better results compared to ultrasound and flexion. Uh, manual therapy, deep transfer friction massage, uh, which was be which has been advocated by Cerex, it acts again your pain mechanism, inhibiting pain uh, mechanism. Uh, Cochrane review says it is not much effective. Okay, it is not much effective when combined with other physiotherapy modalities also. okay so was no better than physiotherapy alone so if you think that if we are just using stretching and strengthening exercises also there is no need of deep transfer friction massage which has any significant uh, improvements uh yes then we have mulligan's manual mobilizations uh yes uh, this mulligan's manual mobilization has proved uh into systemic trials and systemic reviews that it has in moderate to high quantity quality that uh, it is much more effective combined sorry when compared to your deep transfer friction and placebo so i again advocate that stretching strengthening plyometric exercises mulligans we can use definitely soft tissue release mfr so mfr is again uh, focused on giving long Uh, stretch and load during uh, load long uh, much more load and long stretches to specific fascia components yes and releasing the fascia thereby improving the vascularity and improving the flexibility component of the muscle so in 2012 an rct says that it is effective yes definitely it is effective mfr so ffr is generally been treated at three levels one is at your uh epicondyle level another is your forearm level and third is at your wrist uh, insertion levels so when you treat uh, give uh, mfr at these three specific levels you definitely get results muscle energy technique similar uh, brother and sisters um, yes from different mothers uh, met uh, muscle energy technique uh, it is again a soft tissue release technique a soft tissue pain relief techniques here they have two major things uh, post isometric relaxation and reciprocal inhibition in post isometric relaxation what do we generally do we ask the patient to contract the muscle isometrically contract the muscle and then give the relaxation agonist group of muscle and in reciprocal inhibition what we do we ask the patient to do isometric contraction of the agonist group of muscle and then we antagonist muscle is means stretch so basically what you are doing you are doing Concentric activity and eccentric activity. Uh, 
larger group of studies are necessary uh, in this segment uh, to prove the efficacy but in 2013 an rct was done and it is effective in this so currently i am also doing a study on uh, effectiveness of met and mfr in uh, le uh, so that is what we are doing it again taping uh, taping is controversial i would not like to throw much light on this because we have various kind of taping kinesio taping rigid taping sports taping yes but there are no evidence and actually us government has uh, stopped or has prohibited taping itself because kinesio taping because of lack of evidence in supporting the treatment but i was talking to one of my sports physiotherapist friend and uh, we were just discussing about taping in athletes he told that uh, there is one athlete he is an uh, he is a sports physiotherapist for uh, bombay uh, mumbai indians team ipl team he told that uh, you know a uh, certain group of athletes have a psychological dependence on taping and especially with the colors so there is one athlete i will not name it out he prefers uh, one cricketer uh, he prefers to use only pink color of tape yes when he is treated so again uh, lack of evidence of taping is there so uh, i i think it is not uh, appropriate to discuss this also because there is no evidence yes ultrasound therapy i had a question we had a question in polling that is ultrasound effective majority of us will say yes even i used to say yes but all the studies say that it is effective in only acute and initial cases uh lunderberg et al did a study when it was compared with placebo uh, the pain of le patient was better three months after such treatment but there was no much difference in global improvement yes so what does this says that definitely pain reduction is there through ultrasound therapy but there is no much more global improvement so there is no improvement in the muscle strength or recurrence rate of this so again ultrasound therapy we can use it especially with conophoresis in uh treating this condition extra corporeal shockwave therapy basically started with lithotripsy okay lithotripsy is generally used for removing stones from kidney uh so this is what the basic principle of extra corporeal uh, therapy is uh calcified deposit are used and actually us food and drug administrator has only approved for the treatment of plantar fasciitis and le okay so uh rcts have said that uh, it is effective but a recent rct in hong kong state that 72 patients it was done on 72 patients and it failed eswd failed when compared to placebo and there are not not much more systemic reviews available uh, on pubmeds so it is again a controversial and again the eswd machine is much more uh costlier compared to your ultrasound machine so we may use ultrasound machine as a first line of treatment compared to eswd moving on towards laser yes laser therapy has evidence in supporting especially with 904 nanometers of wavelength 904 nanometers of wavelength it gives short term pain relief and reduces disability okay uh orthotex generally made up of neoprene and again controversial uh, cochrane review says there are limited number of trials and the outcome numbers measures are again also some people have just done on pain uh they have not funk, uh, focused on uh, uh functional capacity so we need to focus much more on orthotex tennis elbow brace is generally prescribed and it is advocated and yes it helps the patient to reduce pain and reduce the activity yes and gives adequate time for healing so orthotex acupuncture uh, i am not much more uh, found of promoting this pseudo science uh, again sorry uh, 
many people would not, would not like my this statement but lack of evidence may, forces me to say this no evidence of acupuncture especially with later epicondylgia is considered uh, pink et al found that reduction in pain compared to placebo only occurred in early after treatment but there was no difference after 2 months so again uh, it acts like a placebo treatment okay because our goal is not to reduce pain temporarily our goal is to avoid recurrence yes so acupuncture uh, is not much more adequate prp injections yes platelet rich plasma injections platelets are generally uh, taken from the patient's own blood and they are rich with mesenchymal cells and type 1 collagen and collagen fibers as i said in our first uh, few slides that collagen is much more necessary and prp have shown yes have shown uh, results okay but large number of trials and uh, reviews are still pending but this is a ray of hope this is definitely a ray of hope for uh, long standing chronic elbow cases uh hyaluron gel injections and botulinum toxins yes more used in arthritis and tendon healing yes uh, limited studies are available why tendon uh, arthritis uh, because cartilage and tendon okay cartilage and tendon they have similar properties when it comes to healing so that is why uh, this kinds of injections and botulinum toxins are used uh one more disadvantage with botulinum toxin is that you need to immobilize your uh, fingers and then it leads to stiffness of this fingers when uh, we remobilize so it is generally not advocated uh surgery yes definitely uh when in chronic cases when all the conservative treatments have failed uh somewhere around 4 to 11 percentage of uh, patients it is a huge number if we term it out about 4 to 11 percentage of patient uh, undergo surgery because chronic pain is so disabling it, it creates so much of stress and especially when i term it out about an athlete as i said athlete needs to go back to the field yes so uh, surgery it is definitely but again uh, uh, rehab is necessary post surgery so as much as we can conservatively treat the condition uh, surgery should be avoided and what kind of surgeries are there extensor releases v by slide denervation surgeries and garden procedures uh, again this is an orthopedic topic i would not like to i can show the uh, uh, surgeries later on so uh, minimal invasive surgeries are also into the uh, and they are having good evidence yes yes what is the activity modifications what can we do especially with the tennis players uh, racket hands players uh, how can we select an appropriate racket so it is based on your measurement so what does this initial technique says to proper handle the size from proximal palmar crease okay so this is your proximal palmar crease and the ring crease of the top between your ring finger and middle finger so this should be the measurement of your racket grip okay so this is the measurement of your racket grip lesser than this and larger uh, longer than this this will lead to your improper force uh, distribution and it will lead to tennis elbow or later epicondylgia so here you can clearly see initial uh, yes so size is measured from proximal palmar crease to the these crease middle and ring finger and the measurement is obtained for proper handle size that is if the distance is 4 and 1/2 inches the proper size handle should be 4 and 1/2 inches so for example this is 4 and 1/2 you should take 4 and 1/2 it is 5 inches you are supposed to take 5 inches if it is 3 inches you are supposed to take 3 inches so this is way we can modify and strings can be uh, use racket strings so what are we coming to a conclusion yes it is a very challenging condition yes uh, theoretically and if you have not seen much more patient you see just oh yes it is just a lateral epicondylitis it happens to many people but if the patient goes into a chronic stage 
mark my words it becomes very difficult to come back it becomes very difficult to come back through conservative management and it is our challenging procedure okay so various non surgical modalities are being used based on the expertise and you can you can have activity modifications and first line of treatment should always be conservative management not the surgery and the treatment can become with physiotherapy manual therapy braces okay and oral or topical ansets okay i would recommend topical ansets first rather than oral ansets steroid injections are not at all recommended because of high recurrence and relapse rate okay when we are failing with our conservative approaches we have a ray of hope with our prp injections platelet rich plasma injections and then ultimately surgery okay so what should be the line of management first thing physiotherapy conservatively and in physiotherapy what are we going to do stretching strengthening exercises ultrasound your soft tissue release techniques like mfr met you may try with mulligan mobilizations and if ultrasound fails you may jump to laser therapy these are what i would recommend you if we are failing in this yes we may go to prp injections and later on with prp is also failing surgery is required okay so uh thank you uh thank you very much for listening me uh i would like to share you one more video also uh with this uh just wait a minute Okay. Yes. So the video which I am going to share is uh, the EMG bio feedback video which I have uh, uh, adopted in my uh, therapeutic uh, procedure. Uh, you will see this uh, later on. We'll discuss what we are doing. So these two electrodes are surface electrodes. Yes. we are we using it with uh, we are basically what we'll do we'll first find it out the action potential of uh, larger group of muscles the only disadvantage with this is as these are surface electrodes uh, the accurate muscle is not being identified because ecrv is much more into depth recto radialis covers that muscle but uh, needle electrodes uh, are used uh, we can use needle electrodes uh just to avoid uh, based on day to day practices of needle electrodes i have used surface electrodes so let us see see so here you can see uh, this is the bar graph uh, so this is what one channel is activated this green is nothing but channel 2 and why the uh, voltage is uh, we see it is because of the artifacts so once the patient is doing the uh, activity of this tech sensor you can see this bar graph extending and you can see 41 micro volts uh, being connected
I think my video is hanging. Yes. So what? So what I am doing is I am giving a biofeedback game. Uh, this machine has a peculiar feature of bunny games, plane games, and giving roses. I'm, I I don't want to, I didn't want my uh, uh, to give rose to my patient, so I am giving a bunny to the patient. I think my system is hanging a bit, so you cannot see a proper video. Yes, sir, it is stopped with that finger. Yes. So just going to what we do is uh, after bunny game. Yes. I hope this works it out. So once uh, the patient is doing work like wrist extensions, which we are doing it, the bunny will go up the hill and you will catch the carrot. So here you can see I have set up the two limits at 71 microwatts and 70 microwatts. Yes. So uh, once you cross that 70 microwatts limit, then and then only the uh, bunny will start moving it. And in the rest, you are not supposed to do anything. Okay, so I think it is hanging. Uh, I will stop sharing this device. Uh, yes. Okay, so I've done with my presentations. I hope you all enjoyed it. We have crossed somewhere around 20, 30 minutes. <laughs> no problem. Really, it is a very nice presentation. Mm -hmm. We Thank can you. take questions now. Yes, yes. So can I read it out? Yes, sir. Definitely, definitely. Yes, sir. The first question is from Mr. Panduranga Rao. Sir, yes. as muscles are becoming weak, so there may be chances of muscle knots or bands to be formed. So it can be treated with a dry needling? Uh, I said acupuncture. Uh, dry needling is the brother or sister of that acupuncture. And I usually uh, don't recommend it because of lack of evidence. So uh, there are people who say that it is effective, but uh, evidence says uh, there is no, uh, it is just like a placebo. So we should reframe. We should not touch that area also. Fine, sir. In between, we have many appreciations and uh, <laughs> credits for your presentation, sir. Thank you, thank you. Next question is from Ms. Anisha Singh. Sir, can you differentiate medial epicondylitis and lateral epicondylitis in short? Uh, Anita Singh, I just had... Uh, okay, for you, I will uh, say medial... Ap you have two epicondyles. Uh, one is the uh, medial epicondyle and another is lateral epicondyle. On to the medial epicondyle, we have a uh, flexor group of muscles, common flexor group of muscles for origin. And on to the lateral group of muscle, uh, lateral, we have uh, common extensor group of muscles. So uh, whenever these medial group of muscles are being involved, it is medial epicondylitis. Uh, why I'm saying it medial epicondylitis, I again say that there are lack of evidences or lack of studies which say that there is no inflammation in medial group of muscles. Okay. So there are studies which say that in lateral epicondyle regions and lateral common extensor group of muscles, it is not inflammatory markers are not available. It is tendinosis which is taking place. Okay, so medial epicondylitis, common flexor group of muscles, and it is known as commonly it is known as golfer's elbow, and commonly it is known as uh, lateral epicondyle. It is known as 
tennis elbow fine sir next question is from mr mohan rasu patient affected in posterolateral post elbow dislocation treated on closed reduction elbow using uh, with a three weeks uh, immobilization after removing sling patient complain pain in lateral epicondyle and posterior elbow any suggestion sir ah uh, very long uh, question uh, after question immobilization that... of three weeks he is having uh, pain in his uh, elbow so pain in the elbow will not be related to this condition uh, it would be much more related to your immobilization yes so the best way is to go for uh, muscle energy technique post isometric relaxation and then increase the range of muscle uh, uh, range of the joint and later on uh, you need to focus it on our pain relief modalities like uh, ift or tens which would work it out for that patient yes sir next one is from miss anisha sir muscle stimulator can be used in lateral epicondylitis no i i don't recommend muscle stimulators for using it and uh, because muscle stimulators are basically you can use uh, neuromuscular electrical stimulations nmes or uh, why because the video which we had seen recently uh, the emg biofeedback video uh, that muscle uh, nmes what does that do it stimulates the muscle and then you ask the patient to contract so after every stimulation the strength of the muscle will increase yes so that is you can use neuromuscular electrical stimulation rather than your uh, galvanic stimulation or your ferradic stimulations or surge ferradic stimulations because uh, your nerve is not getting involved you don't have uh, nerve injuries you have your muscle injuries which is taking place yes sir. next one is from ms rutwa sir if patient have cervical pain along with elbow pain what should be the treatment uh cervical pain with elbow pain as i said in our differential diagnosis uh, we first need to uh, check it out uh, whether it is uh, the cervical uh, radiculopathy or myopathy which has been affected first thing uh, if the cervical pain is there we need to definitely treat that uh, and uh, if you find that with your cosm stress or min stress uh, your uh, lateral epicondyle pain is also there so there are two basic conditions which are clubbed into patient so you need to treat your cervical pain also through your uh, uh, what we say cervical uh, treatments like your traction or your ift and your uh, isometric neck exercises and your mckenzie techniques uh, and then you also need to treat your lateral epicondyle yes sir one more question from our youtube sub subscriber explain isotonic con contraction once again sir isotonic contraction contraction so isotonic yeah. contractions are basically the tone of the muscle is not increasing yes so in tone of the muscles if not increasing what is increasing the length of the muscle is increasing isometric means the length of the muscle is not increasing okay and isokinetic means your force of the muscle contraction remains same okay so in isotonic contractions you have if i can have an access to the white board i'll explain it over here itself so uh, just for an example the black line over this is your origin and pink line over this is your insertion okay so if the if this is your uh, red line is basically uh, the muscle acting so in isotonic action this is your insertion so if this is moving towards your origin this is your concentric group of muscle acting and moving it ahead of from this insertion yes through this this is your eccentric bear with my handwritings and bear with my uh, presentations but this is what happens yes so isotonic your tone of the muscle is not increasing your uh, length of the muscle changes yes yes sir fine the next question is from mr jitender how does botox help in l e yes so botox uh, basically botulinum toxin has uh, effects in uh, pain reductions as per the studies which have been uh, shared i would like to share that study also if i it is handy with me uh, yes just wait a minute yes sir
Yes. So I can share it with you all so that. See, uh, hyaluronic gel injections and botulinum toxins. Yes. So here it is written that uh, for Botox, okay, uh, botulinum toxin into the extensor digitorum longus muscle is given. Okay, annotation. Yes. Botulinum toxin in extensor digitorum muscle is given. And it basically, uh, third and fourth fingers paralyzes the muscle and cannot do the extensor tendon and help the patient to recover from EE, LE. So basically, it helps in reduction in the pain and getting the uh, movement reduction to be done. So immobilizing component is used in Botox, but it is highly uh, still in prima phases. Uh, so it is highly discouraged currently because there are not much more significant evidence available for this. Fine, sir. Uh, next question is from Dr. Vinish Kumar. Difference between lateral epicondylagia and myositis ossificans, how to diagnose it? Uh, myositis ossification is because of your ossification formation into the muscles. Yes. Uh, so it is generally done uh, post immobilizations. And epicondylagia, it is a tendon healing procedure. Yes. So if the tendon is not healed properly, you have fibroblasts coming into picture, miniature bones. Formation, decreased vascularization, neovascularization. Whereas myositis ossification is totally a different uh, condition, which is uh, based on the miniature bone formations or uh, because of immobilization. Fine. The next one is from again Mr. Jitender. Sir, how can we improve supination in an old RTA case, one year old, that is when pronation is 0 to 80 and supination is 0? Supination in old uh, case, RTA. A road traffic accident case. Yes, you yes. first need to see whether uh, uh, joint play move movements of your distal uh, radio ulnar joints and proximal radio ulnar joints. And based on that joint play motion, you please select uh, the glides. I personally, uh, in uh, chronic cases, uh, if I say midline glides are much more effective compared to your uh, Calton bond or Mulligan techniques. Fine. The next one is from Ms. Nikita. Thank you, sir, for your presentation. Uh, sorry, many more appreciations again in between. <laughs> yes, sir. Next one is from Mr. Rajesh Kumar. Patient was chronic pain in the elbow, that is lateral epicondyle region. Patient does not uh, do ADL activity. Uh, Rajesh Kumar, I'll unmute you. You can yes. ask your question. Uh, meanwhile, I'll request the uh, organizers, please, if you can share, uh, click the pictures of this. Hello, sir. Uh, okay. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, we have taken some pictures. Don't Hello, sir. Yes, yes. Sir, patient was uh, elbow, elbow in lateral epicondyle. Injured. It's sudden accident. Injury. It's chronic pain. In last uh, five months, uh, you can explain the question in your regional language also, so that uh, you know these people, uh, the organizers, will explain you in uh, language which I understand. You know Tamil. Rajesh Kumar, Tamil, mm -hmm. Tiringa, Tamil, 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 Tamil. Ah, okay, sir. Sir, elbow la, lateral epicard la, or ke sadhana accident hai chhi, bike accident hai. Hello. Bike accident like Kiri with the elbow full support like Kiri with the Muda or pain air can run a fracture in the Kadia, normal arcade, external and normal. And our pain mother can try. Okay, sir, a client with RTA who fell from his bike has fallen on his elbow and his investigation shows everything as negative, but only there is pain in his elbow region. So, what yes. management can be done? Yes. Uh, what is the duration? Immediate, sir. Just now he is coming after an RTA. Five months. Acute. Five months. Acute, acute. Acute. So, uh, please see there whether uh, any bursa is involved or not. Yes. Uh, has he underwent with any ultrasonography of the elbow or MRI? 
He said only X-ray, sir. He had undergone with X-ray. There are no fractures. So with but soft X-rays, we just come to yes. X-rays, which which just we come to know about uh, the uh, bones. Yes, we won't be getting a clear picture idea about the bursa or the ligaments. And uh, it is as it is. Uh, what we say, uh, a traumatic injury. Yes, not not basically a non-traumatic injury. So we may suspect a contusion injury. Or a bursa which has been inflamed, like you may have a student's elbow, any kind of that. Fine, sir. Next question is from Mr. Ravi Prakash. In advanced case, people show symptoms like pain while doing wrist flexion. Also, yes, because of eccentric group of muscle. Yes, so that is what I said. That you know, uh, in the backhand stroke also, what the role of eccentric group of muscle is to extend the wrist. Yes. but once the ball which hits the racket what it will do it will give a counter force and immediately after extension we, we are supposed to do it wrist flexion sir wrist flexion flexion is because the eccentric exercises eccentric group of uh, component which is acting on your ecrb that is the reason why it gets pain in wrist flexion also and that is what your mills test do okay Yes, sir. Uh, no more questions. Dear participants, you have any questions? Yeah, one more has raised. Sir, is there any need of investigation like X-ray for tennis elbow? Uh, no, dear, not at all. Uh, we luckily uh, uh, our special tests are much more uh, reliable and valid for this condition. Uh, if you have, uh, if you are performing an accurate test in an accurate manner, your Cousins test. Mills tests and Motley tests are more than sufficient to diagnose later epicondylgia. Okay. Fine, sir. Uh, we'll conclude the session. Before concluding, I'll ask our volunteer uh, Prachi Butch to take over and conclude the session, sir. Uh, Prachi Butch, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah. Ah. Uh... hello uh, it was a very informative Thank session you. sir hello yes 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 can hear you yes is everyone able to hear me yeah 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 uh, it was a very informative session sir thank you for speaking about this topic lateral epicondylgia is not very frequently discussed and you explained everything starting from basic anatomy to pathophysiology the three special test the outcome measures all the outcome measures the treatment uh, evidence based treatment programs in very detail uh, i'm sure all the participants uh, must have gained a lot of knowledge from the presentation uh, thank you for solving doubts of participants enthusiastically and patiently we appreciate uh, making you making time in your busy schedule on sunday uh, once again thank you dr pat trivedi sir the organizing team exrx india team and all the participants it wouldn't have been uh, possible without all of your support thank you again thank you so much yes sir thank you very much sir for the wonderful explanation even about the researchers so that only have boosted this session especially sir so it would have been success without any research yes this research has given the main importance on your session yes. sir thank you very much I, I would, for it I, to all the presenters and even i think we are going on live with the youtube also yes sir to all those who are listening uh, you know the trend of uh, what we say uh, giving treatments uh, without evidence is now need to be uh, changed yes especially post covid era if it was not like that then we would have uh, treatments for uh, covid 19 also yes so till this date we are not finding out an optimum treatment for covid 19 this itself says that there is we need to have an evidence in treating whatsoever we are having so without evidence please if somebody is you know saying that uh, if i also if i am saying that you know an x thing which i am giving is much more uh, effective compared to a y thing which is already there please just don't blindly believe this okay please ask for evidence and evidences like case reports definitely if we term it about research uh, even an expert like me if i say that you know uh, tying your uh, lateral elbow with a towel will reduce your pain that is an expert opinion okay 
so you may believe you may not believe then it goes to uh, a case study reports after case study report it goes to your uh, rcts and after rcts it goes to your systemic analysis systemic reviews so if any treatment which has systemic reviews in positive favor definitely that is a valid treatment so please focus it on and i request all the budding and young therapists and even the clinicians please try to focus on uh, the evidence treatment approach now because it is a it is it was be taught and it was been practiced in western countries somewhere around 15 to 20 years back yes and we are still lacking in that so we need to move on with this thank you thank you sir thank i you. hope we can have one more session clearly on evidence based physiotherapy sir thank in future thank you thank you sure sir <laughs> Thank you, okay. thank you, thank you, Patri Vedi. I was yes. uh, having a little uh, net issues and uh, power issues. You did very well. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye, bye, all. Good night. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you.